Well, hello. I'm Wendy Burton. I'm a GP from Brisbane, and I'm here with my colleague, Betsy Peach. And Betsy is a genetic counsellor from SOGI in Brisbane. And we're going to talk to you today about the options for genetic testing once pregnancy has been confirmed. So this would be a conversation in early pregnancy with a couple who are interested in knowing what their choices are for finding out about the health and well-being or the potential health and well-being of their baby. So Betsy, gosh, um, ideally we would have done some of this talking and discussing and consenting and testing preconception, but that hasn't happened. That hasn't happened. So in terms of what do we do, where do we go, do we start as always with a history? Is that the best mm. place? It's a great question. I think that starting with a history is always an important thing. Mm -hmm. um, from a pregnancy standpoint, one of the big things that you'll want to do as well is confirm how far along a patient is. So obviously either a dating scan, mm -hmm. blood work to make sure that we know exactly what we're talking about time frame would be appropriate as well. Um, pregnancy history from the couple, family history to examine if there's any history of other birth defects, multiple mm -hmm. miscarriages, things that might increase the chance there could be something going on genetic. Got a, a dating scan. Mm -hmm. uh, we've established that the, uh, there we, we have a viable pregnancy, so baby is alive. Um, and let's say it's early pregnancy, so we're eight, eight weeks, mm -hmm. uh, eight weeks in. Yep. Okay. So I'm familiar with first trimester combined screening where we do a nuchal translucency scan and we do some blood work with that and put those two things together. That essentially was designed, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, to help identify uh, a child who's at a high risk of having Down syndrome, trisomy 13 or trisomy 18. Uh, but gosh, that's gone the way of the dodo now that we've got the NIPT or the non-invasive prenatal testing, hasn't it? No. <laughs> no? You can't get rid of it. I think it's very important to make a distinction between what things can screen for. Okay. So importantly, the non-invasive prenatal test, or the NIPT, um, the bottom line for this is screening for Down syndrome, trisomy 18, trisomy 13. That was the original goal, and it has the highest level of detection for those three conditions. And so for those three, it is better than the traditional combined first trimester ultrasound and other blood tests. But what we found is that it can tell us nothing about birth defects or other things going on. So for example, if a patient has just the NIPT, we can't learn about the potential for heart defects or spina bifida or other chromosome anomalies. Whereas if they have a detailed scan at 12 to 14 weeks, we can get information that may guide us better understanding what the health of the baby may be and provide additional options for testing for a family. So actually, this is a really important point, and so I'm glad you've made it, Betsy. So we do actually strongly recommend that a detailed first trimester uh, anatomy scan is done, and there is uh, some difference in opinion about whether the blood should or should not be done, but there is some added benefit or some added information that they can give, which probably makes them useful still at this point in time. But the NIPT, my goodness, that's such a gift because we can now tell if a baby has Down syndrome just with a blood test, yes? No, Wendy. <laughs> no, you do it my head in. Really, really important thing is yeah. the difference between screening and looking for something and picking the possibility of something up and knowing for certain. Mm -hmm. And NIPT, as good as it is, it is excellent, but it is not an answer. It's a screening tool and that is why it should never be used in isolation. If the NIPT test flags an increased risk for Down syndrome, it is strongly recommended, suggested, and almost required in many cases to follow that up with invasive pro proven testing because we need to make sure that it's not something else biological going on, such as the mother's DNA count, the placenta DNA count. We need to prove that it's truly the baby who's got Down syndrome causing this result to come back high. So the NIPT is a screening test. Yes. It tells you whether your child is at a high risk or low risk of having this condition. Correct. If they are a low risk, that's still not a 100% guarantee that the child does not have the condition, mm -hmm. but we accept generally that that would be a pause point for further testing for that condition. Mm -hmm. Correct. If a child has a high risk, of one of these conditions, then further testing is recommended. It is actually really required to know for sure 
if this child is affected. Now this would be the CVS or the amniocentesis testing, depending upon how far along in a pregnancy a woman is by the time we have this information. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, these tests do carry with them a risk of miscarriage, although the most recent data on that is showing that that's safer than we previously, previously thought. Mm -hmm. um, but the diagnostic test is important. Betsy, I'm gonna blow everybody's mind by mentioning this, but positive and negative predictive value, does that matter? Absolutely. Ugh. Absolutely. What is it? It's a distant <sighs> memory for me from statistics. Well, I think that I'll be the first to admit I'm not a statistician. Mm -hmm. However, in the context of NIPT, it is incredibly important to understand the differences between some of the terminology. NIPT has a brilliant detection rate for most of the conditions that it looks for. Now, detection rate means that if the condition is out there in the population, what's the chance we're going to find it with these tests? So it's quite high. The flip side of that, however, is positive predictive value. And what this means is if the condition comes back at an increased risk from this testing, what's the chance that the kid really has it, the pregnancy is affected? And that can vary significantly based on the different conditions that are found and based on a mother's age associated with what her background risk was prior to the screening. So for example, if a risk comes back increased for Down syndrome, it has a very good positive predictive value through the NIPT, but it's different for a woman who's 40 versus a woman who's 25. Mm -hmm. And that needs to be made clear. Um, a background risk for a woman who's 40 is already much greater than those who are 25 for Down syndrome, and so because she starts at a higher point, the positive predictive value is greater. But in general, almost all NIPTs for Down syndrome that come back at increased risk have a positive predictive value of 80% up to 95%, so it is quite good. So why are we having this discussion? I think more of the reason to talk about it is there is no other test included in NIPT that has that high mm -hmm. of a positive predictive value. I think the thing that matters most about the positive predictive values in light of NIPT is the fact that there's many different things you can choose to include. So there's a few conditions that you can decide whether you want to look at or not. So Down syndrome we've discussed, but what if you decided that you wanted to look at the sex chromosome aneuploidies, conditions in which there's an extra or missing sex chromosome in a person. Mm -hmm. The most common of these is called Turner syndrome, and often people tick the box to include whatever they can find in an NIPT test, but I would suggest that a bit more detail needs to be looked at. For example, Turner syndrome has a positive predictive value from an NIPT of about 50%. Oh. So, flip okay. a coin. Yeah. Comes back high risk, does your kid have it or not? 50% is high enough still to warrant invasive testing risk, but it could be because the mom has some missing X's in her cells and it doesn't cause her any problems. She's called mosaic. The placenta may have missing X's and it's not the kid at all which means that a woman and a family have to deal with this high risk result thinking that it has a 90% accuracy when in fact the positive predictive value is much lower. Okay, so it sounds kind of complicated. It can be. It can be, all right. So I guess the message we want to get out about the NIPT test is it is a very good test, especially for Down syndrome, but it's not the point where it, everything starts and everything stops. There are other tests that are recommended, the ultrasound scan. Uh, there are other blood tests that are recommended. And if a test comes back high risk, it's not a certainty that that child is actually affected. We do need to do more testing before making decisions about where to from here. Absolutely. Okay. And a conversation about what you might do with that information before you start consenting to the test mm -hmm. may be appropriate for any couple. Right. Okay, so, so ultrasound scan, NIPT test, but what about the couple who maybe, the history suggests that there may be some cystic fibrosis in the extended family. Is it too late to be testing now? Oh, that's a great question. Ideally, things get looked at preconceptionally because hopefully you've had those conversations with your family. But no, it's not too late. Mm -hmm. So when a pregnancy is established and your first visit with your GP, if there is something important in the family history or a patient and our partner are keen to get information about the more common possible stuff, screening can still be done through blood testing for cystic fibrosis, SMA, which is spinal muscular atrophy, and fragile X testing. 
These are the common three. These are the ones that are typically recommended. However, it's important to understand that there are also large carrier panels for which we can test the parents to see if they carry the same mutations, which would increase the risk for their children to have genetic conditions. I guess the hard part with that is the timing. And mm -hmm. so you need to have that conversation. When you test a single partner, it generally takes two, maybe three weeks for a result to come back. And then if that pa partner is positive, we then need to test the other person. And that can take another two to three weeks. So I would suggest that you have an honest conversation about the timing and what you might do with the information at the time of that visit with your GP in that first early pregnancy. Because we could start testing for both partners at the same time and we would get the information back faster. So for example, uh, say there's a family history of spinal muscular atrophy mm. uh, and we test mum at, at the eight week mark and it turns out we get that result back by 11 weeks and she's a carrier. Yes. Gosh, uh, we should have tested dad back when we tested mum but we didn't. So we're gonna test dad now, it's 11 weeks. So we're gonna test dad and we get his result back. Can they do that quickly? It just takes as long Still as it takes, takes as long so as it maybe takes. it's now 13, 14 weeks and dad's a carrier. Mm. So what is the chance that their child actually has spinal muscular atrophy? Mm. So with this type of testing, mm -hmm. it would be 25% chance that each of their children would be, um, would have SMA. So a one in four. One in four. Okay. And based on that information, parents need to decide if they want to know. Mm -hmm. And if they want to know during a pregnancy, that would require the invasive testing options. Like we were talking about with the Down syndrome. Exactly. So that would be a um, CVS or an amniocentesis, but we're now getting along. Closer to amniocentesis. Yeah, time. okay, and it's gonna take how long to get that result back? So it depends, but we would say up to two weeks. Okay, so now we're looking at 16 weeks. Okay, and we get that result back. Probably, to be honest, closer to the 18 week mark mm -hmm. because amniocentesis generally can't be done till 15, 16 weeks. Okay. So you're talking 17, 18 weeks before you have that information in hand, mm -hmm. at which stage you need to make decisions based on that. Yeah. There are some also modifying factors related to SMA, and that gets into some complicated genetic things, which is definitely at that stage you need to be talking to a genetic specialist. Absolutely. But there mm -hmm. may be some more information available that will take even longer that can clarify the situation related to this particular type of SMA we might be looking at. Okay, all right. So I guess, um, certainly in that situation where there is a family history, mm -hmm. I think really just test both, uh, because the time frames are way too long. And I think if a couple have fallen pregnant and they do want to have this information, then just be mindful of those timelines. If you, so if you do decide to go ahead, maybe do that as early, well no, do that as early as possible. Preconception's ideal, but seeing as we're already pregnant, maybe at the four to five week mark yep. for mum, and then if mum's a carrier, then definitely get dad done ASAP yeah. so that it makes the options easier and earlier. Um, and more time for just decision making because mm. all of this can be incredibly stressful for a family as you what can imagine What do you do well. with what you find? Yeah. So that's actually one of the things, please consider. If you don't know what you would do, if you don't know if you would continue with a pregnancy knowing that your child carried a, a lethal, because mm. some of these conditions are incompatible with life, a lethal condition or if you knew that your child would uh, be born with a significant disability but we don't always know how disabled your child might be they might have down syndrome and be a paralympian mm -hmm. they might have down syndrome and forever need full-term assistance we cannot tell by the tests that we can do okay okay so so Betsy I guess for myself as a Brisbane GP gosh it's easy for me I can refer to you you're just down the road mm -hmm. But what about our families in the regions and the rural and the remote parts of the country? Are there options for them, online uh, options, telehealth options, so that they can be really informed about these kind of decisions? Absolutely. There's been a large increase in the number of available genetic services and genetic counseling services through private-based, also through Genetic Health Queensland locally in this state. You can access genetic counseling services through telemedicine, video conferencing, and sometimes just online. Usually we would talk about more detailed information coming from an actual conversation, so I would probably promote the telemedicine versus mm -hmm. just online resources. Okay. Um, so in summary, oh my gosh, it's the end of 2018 and there's never been more options in pregnancy. Some of them are expensive, uh, some of them are confusing, but please do consider your personal and your family history. Make yourself 
aware of what the options are that are out there and what sits comfortably with yourself and your partner in terms of how you would wish to proceed and what would be important for you to know. Understand the limitations of the test. A positive does not always mean that your child has the condition, nor does a negative always mean that your child does not have the condition, although how accurate a test is varies and that could be discussed with your doctor or your midwife. Okay. So, or, of course, with a genetic, genetic counsellor. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. All right. Thanks, Betsy.